Here we go. We have our MCAT tips. So I wanted to start this out with uh, what the MCAT is to each of you, just to kind of get a bearing of um, how you all feel about the MCAT. So what is it? What is it to you? You're each here, so you're planning on taking the MCAT. And so in some way or another, each of you has an idea of what the MCAT is. Oh, it looks like we got a comment. I'll pull that up. Okay. It's a test that medical schools use to determine your admission chances. Okay. Test to get in med school, like the SAT. Good. So obviously it's the, the, the medical college admissions test, right? It's the standardized test. It's a metric that a, a lot of colleges uh, use in order to see if you're gonna fit with their class. Um, but more on a personal level, what does it mean to you? What is the MCAT um, to you? And why is it such a big deal? Stress, fear, anxiety, good. Yep, all those things are associated with the MCAT. I know personally uh, how that feels. Anybody else? Hard test, yeah. Anybody else? All right. Um, how uh, somebody mentioned the SAT? How is it uh, formatted, and how is it similar to other standardized tests, and how is it different from other standardized tests? Say the SAT. And you can reply in the chat or you can turn your mic off and uh, or your, your mute off and just re respond. Okay, so most other tests the, in the chat, is, if you can see math, science based, uh, little to no language arts, yes, to a certain degree. It's not going to ask you about language arts, but it's uh, heavily involved reading and critical reasoning, which is kind of what language arts sometimes uh, approaches in SAT or other standardized tests, heavily involved with that. So it's not just a, a fact-based test where you have to recall all these science and math and, and all these uh, chemistry questions. Um, can you the it tests if you can take a basic understanding of those subjects and apply it to this this scenario this uh, this question this passage that you have never even approached before like you'll be asked about aerodynamics or or aerospace engineering nobody will have studied aerospace engineering or very very few will have had that exposure. So they don't care that you you don't know exactly what the the topic is, but they want to see can you take these these more basic topics and apply it to the scenario that's totally new and can you keep your cool in doing that or do you get flustered because you see something in a novel scenario? That's what they're trying to do. They're trying to throw it all at you in in a way that looks like oh there's no way I can even approach this, but it's all basic science. It's all basic information that they're having you apply and many of the questions are just can you read what it's saying and decipher and and tease out the important information from it okay okay so let's see how is it different good so let's get on to the portions there are four main sections you've got your biological and biochemical foundations of living system sec session uh, section, BBFL is what that's called, uh, and then chemical physical foundations of biological system section, psychological social and biological foundations and behavior section, and then the cl critical analysis and reasoning skills section. So these three will have greater applications to biology 
chemistry and behavioral sciences. But again, within each of these, there's a lot of reading, there's a lot of uh, questions that are going to refer to just the information presented. You don't even have to recall previous information. You just have to be able to read the question and understand what they're talking about, okay? That is 100% of what the critical analysis and reasoning skills section is. There is no previous knowledge that's required for this section. It's all, can you read a passage and understand what the author's point of view is and what, their, uh, what the scenario that they're setting up is and tease out that information and reason and analyze the, the passage answering questions about it. All of the questions in that section refer back to the passage. Okay, so understanding the passage is all you need to get by. And I say is all you need to get by because, uh, uh, or a bit lightly, it's probably one of the harder of all the sections. Okay, so these are our main divisions in, um, in the MCAT. So a little history of it. How old is the MCAT? It was developed in 1928. It's gone through a bunch of revisions and iterations. They've changed um, grading, they've changed the sections, they've changed what they're looking for. Uh, the most recent revision, uh, as far as an overhaul of the test was in 2015. And they changed the, the scoring number, but it's still, they didn't really change it. They just um, moved the, the scale a little bit differently. And it's, it's still a bell curve and it's still uh, pretty much the same range. Um, so recently they also shortened the MCAT um, for uh, COVID issues and for all the um, problems with test taking centers that came from that. Uh, but that has again recently been reverted back to the original uh, timing. So make sure to look and, and see uh, previously over the last couple of years, it was dropped down to five hours and 45 minutes or something like that, but it's back up to the uh, almost seven hours of, of content time. Um, so the most recent change was put in to add the psychological, social, and behavioral sciences subjects. Why do you think they did that? Why did they they change? They took out the writing portion. They condensed the the science, the biology, and the um, chemistry a little bit, and then they added in the psychological, social, and behavioral sciences. Why? Hi. Uh, well, I think uh, that medicine is changing, and I think that now we try to look at more of the behavioral sciences aspect so it's important to uh, test that knowledge exactly um so the the type of doctor that um is that the american medical association and you know the associations that are in charge of of this the type of doctor has shifted away from a pure scientist and um you know scientific clinician to having a broader understanding of, you know, they, you still need the science, don't get away from that, but you need this um, more rounded understanding of psychological, social, and behavioral aspects in order to best serve your patients, right? A lot of physicians from previous eras were so, so uh, science oriented and they, they knew that really well and that was great, but they could not connect with their patients in some cases uh, because they were so focused on that and they didn't necessarily have this, this skill uh, in the psychological, social, and behavioral sciences. So in an effort to have a more diverse um, physician body, they added these, these subjects, right? Anybody else have any other comments? Joseph said, um, medicine is trying to become more empath empathic, uh, empathetic and understanding when it comes to patients, patient complaints, exactly. So adding in this um, more diverse patient population, they tend to react better to uh, 
more diverse physician population. Okay, so broadening the the type of physician um, that is going to be treating these people, uh, and that's one of the big things that we focus here at uh, CHSU is having a, a diverse class, diverse in experience and many other aspects, uh, so that we have the best experience, we have the best um, input to uh, to learning and and approach it in a more diverse manner. Um, so yeah, I think that's all we'll talk about for that. Um, again, they retooled other sections there. So our scoring for the MCAT is from a low of 472 to a high of eight, uh, 528. Um, these Again, this is the the test is scored um, on a range, uh, and I think I forgot to delete that. So you can see this you can see this bell curve here uh, that's covered up by this. Um, this is uh, always shifting. They they constantly are recalculating the grades for any given test based on how students are performing and and matching it to the bell curve um, so within from year to year you'll see these percentiles shift a little bit uh, but in general this is how it's going to land uh, and so if we jump over here we can see um, this mid-range so right in the middle of the bell curve is right about the 50th percentile as for what medical schools are looking for if you score above 500 in this range, it's an okay score. Uh, it's not terribly competitive, but um, if you have other things to back that up, you may get some, some looks, right? And um, you're not gonna get looks from uh, schools that have much higher averages. And uh, so you're gonna have to be, you're gonna have to understand based on this and your other metrics, um how you might compare for what a school is looking for specifically right and again many schools have different things that they're attracted to um some schools really still are devoted to the sciences and so they want somebody really with a a, a high mcat high uh gpa research experience all of these different things if they're going to be going into research um medicine other schools uh, might be looking for rural uh, doctors. And, and so in an effort to in, include a more diverse group, they're going to drop the MCAT down a little bit lower, okay? Um, so just understanding what a school is looking for and uh, playing that to that strength. Um, the 504 to 509, this is getting up in a, a pretty good territory, right? You're, you're gonna be a bit more competitive um, and you're going to have a, a better look at uh, more schools. Obviously, up here, 510 to 520, um, th these are great scores, really, really competitive. And anything above uh, that, the 521 to 528, this is just smash it out of the park. Um, and the, the number of people who do this is uh, pretty, pretty limited each year. Um, looking at the numbers, if you look at the bell curve, it's like 0.021% scores between 528 and 524. So that's like 20 or 30 people a year out of the 85,000 tests taken a year, um, which also means you, know, you have the same limit on this. A couple hundred people are going to score in here, and then you'll start to increase as you, as you move down this direction. Okay. Um, let's see, looking over at these averages, uh, the average MD matriculated medical student, so the first year medical student has a 511 MCAT score, right? And again, this is a range, that's just the, the mean, uh, so they'll accept above and below that, uh, but most of the students are going to fall within that, that range. Um, the range runs typically 503 to 521 uh, for what uh, MD schools have as their average. So 
uh, schools that are extremely high tier, extremely competitive, they're going to have an average of 521, right? Which is insane. There's uh, the, that's a really high average. And then as you drop back down, other schools will fall in between that with a low in the MD of about 504. Uh, DO average across all schools is a 504. And then um, that range runs from some schools, mostly rural, are going to have lower, so 498 average, uh, with um, more competitive DO schools uh, reaching about 510. And again, that's just an average. So you'll still, each school will have its own range. Um, what you're competing against is the um, MD schools admit 22,666 students last year, and DO schools admitted about 8,200. Uh, so there's about 30,000 seats in medical school every year. And if we look at the test taken each year, um, you know, this is multiple attempts as well. Um, so the matriculation rate is, is pretty low. And then you have previous years uh, applying and uh, international grads applying. So there's quite, quite a few, uh, <laughs> there's not many spots, right? You all know that the, it's, it's a, a difficult game that you're playing. So the scoring of the MCAT, I don't want to focus too much on it, um, but obviously you want to try and get as much as you can. But once you have your score, you need to take into account what schools are most likely going to accept that. Does anybody have any questions so far with the MCAT scoring? All right. So the test, I said that they bumped up the time again. Uh, so the overall content time is about six hours and 15 minutes. Um, and that's not including breaks and the, the time that it takes to go through other portions, certification, a tutorial. Um, the end of survey, all of that stuff is going to bring it right around seven to seven and a half hours of uh, time that it's going to take you. Each of the sections has about 50 or has 59 questions and you get 95 minutes for that. Um, the question breakdown is 10 passages with four to six questions per passage. And then in between those, you'll have little spurts of um, three to five questions with that are just independent only by themselves, right? Those are going to be more of your recall questions. And then the passage based questions, there will be a little bit of recall in there, but it's mostly, can you figure out what the passage is calling and apply this knowledge to it? Okay. Um, so that's the basic breakdown of the test, uh, at, uh, on testing day. As you can see, this is a full work day. This is a long test. Um, so one of the biggest things about the uh, MCAT is endurance. Do, have you taken the steps necessary to be able to endure eight, almost eight hours of testing straight? Okay. And Joseph, yes, two, 528 is the maximum possible score. Um, that's the upper range and the lower range is the 472. So um, understanding each of these sections and being able to kind of compartmentalize them so that you move from section to section and you don't dwell on the previous sections is going to be a part of your planning for the MCAT. Um, so I'm going to go over about six tips. This is based on a publication that me and a, a another faculty um, published in 2019 um, that I you may have access to it, and I, I forget if we've sent that, but uh, it, it's basically these same tips of how to go about preparing for the MCAT. Um, so three main phases, you have a planning phase where this will encompass finishing essential coursework, registration, doing your diagnostic exam, and then you have a studying phase. Create your study plan, review content, and enhance those reading skills. And then finally, the testing. This is before the actual test, right? You need to practice passages, 
and you need to practice full length pra pra practice exams. Once you're able to endure an entire full length exam, then you're, you're gonna be ready. That's the, your final step, okay? So tip one, when are you gonna learn the content that you're gonna be tested on the MCAT? This is going to be during your school, right? During your, your courses. The, the prerequisite uh, courses for medical schools align very, very closely with the topics on the MCAT because that's what you're gonna need, right? The test is gonna test if you're ready for medical school, medical school says this is what you need to be ready. So they're gonna align pretty closely, which means you have an advantage. You already know what you're going to be taught and or what you're going to need to get into medical school. So if you focus in class on understanding the material, a lot of times, and you know, it's easy for me as a, an instructor and a professor to say, oh, don't focus on the, the points and the nitty gritty details. And you just need to learn, right? Everyone, I just wish we could all learn, man, right? It, I know it's more complex than that, but it's true. If you can learn to understand and apply the material while you're in the course, rather than just memorizing to get a good grade, which is also important to a certain degree, you need that grade to, to get to the next step. But the MCAT is gonna be so much easier if you've already learned to apply the content in your, those undergrad courses, okay? So that's when you're going to finish your coursework. That's when you're gonna learn the material for the MCAT. These are the most common prerequisite courses and how they line up with the various sections of um, the MCAT. So taking these courses and using them to hone your skills for the MCAT, if that's your final goal, is going to be your best preparation. Um, a lot of courses, uh, MCAT prep courses produce their little books and uh, their materials for review because it's important to be able to review the material, but if you're spending your entire or a majority of your MCAT prep time on content review, you're wasting your time, okay? Your best use is not going to be strictly review, okay? Uh, and we'll get into what your best use will be. That's not to say don't focus on review and don't use review to your advantage, it's just that's not your main weapon, okay? Um, so here we've got all of our courses, general chemistry, organic chemistry, physical, calculus, research. This is CPFBS. Um, research is added on here because the, many of the passages are gonna be a presentation of a research scenario or the way that they've set up an experiment. And if you don't understand the assays and the techniques that are used, the, the basic science techniques, then you aren't going to be able to know what to focus on in the question. If it asks you, you know, what, what the, um, the most important part for this science experiment was, or, or what was their independent variable, or you know, whatever the, the question is gonna zero in on in that science experiment, if it just looks like garbage, uh, jargon, you know, mix of scientific terms to you, then you're not gonna be ready to answer those questions, even if you know all the other content, all the other material. So a lot of the questions are approached that way. Um, so research can be helpful. And that's why taking the labs associated with biology, chemistry, and physics um, classes is pretty important for uh, the MCAT. Uh, CARS, again, it's not strict language arts, but you need reading skills. You need an understanding of English. This is the hardest section for uh, students who have English as a second language because you haven't had as long of an exposure to the English language and deciphering what the vocabulary means and what the, the uh, off author opinions are, it, it sets you at a disadvantage just to begin with. So reading a, a wide variety of materials, and we'll get to that one as well. But yeah, philosophy, humanities, liberal arts, those are all things that you're going to have to read a lot and, and figure out what uh, authors' opinions are or other, other 
uh, artists' opinions are. BBFL, general biology, anatomy, physiology, all these fun things. Again, research could be lumped in here as well. And then the biological and social sciences uh, is going to be most helpful there. Okay. Um, so these are, here's our basic tips. Don't just finish a course, but do well in the course. And when I say do well, I mean learn to apply the material. Okay. Because that's what you're going to be doing on the MCAT. Um, upper level science courses typically do this a little bit better than lower level science courses. So try to get a few of those upper level science courses, or if you can get into a graduate uh, course or at different uh, universities do it differently. Um, but if you can take these kind of higher up level, they approach it as, as usually a similar way, looking at experiments and how things were um, studied in order to get to where we are now with our scientific knowledge. Um, so those will help you enhance your critical thinking. Uh, and again, not all schools are going to have the same prereqs. So be sure to check what each school wants you to have learned, not just you know what the MCAT is going to prepare you. Okay, next tip to prepare is you got to register. Okay, um, when should you register? There are two periods that the MCAT is offered. Uh, January through March to June tests, and those are open typically in October, the second week of October. So you can't register for those for the following year until October hits. And once October hits, they go quick. So registering early is going to get you a seat in a place that you are um, most comfortable with. If you don't... <laughs> Uh, if you if you wait to register, there the spots fill up quickly, and you may be forced to go to a, a place outside of your local area. Um, I had to drive or uh, even fly to another city in order to take the MCAT because there were literally no other options, and I still wanted to take it that year. Right, so you have to plan ahead. And this is when the dates open. They'll, they'll change the days tip, typically each year. It'll be a little bit different. Um, so just be aware of that. But the general timing is the same. The other period is July through September tests. And those open in February um, of each year. So you have to register both early and um, it's best to time it for when you want to submit your application, um, which would typically give you the most amount of preparation time. And so what I mean by that is um, the scheduled date should, again, with your MCAT prep, your date will need to, it, it has to be, uh, it doesn't have to be, but it is recommended that the date that you take the test is going to be right when you're hitting your full stride in studying. And we'll talk about what that really means. Um, but the, the pinnacle of your study, the time that you're spending entire days uh, of the entire week on your study, because you're, you've got that stamina built up and you're ready to go and you're, you've got all these, these uh, practice exams that you've been taking, that's when you want to hit the test right after you've done that. You don't want to have reached that pinnacle and then wait several weeks or a month uh, or longer until you have to take that test because your stamina quickly goes back and you just you haven't been practicing it. And you can't maintain that for really long periods of time, right? You can't maintain the concerted effort in the MCAT study that you need for months on end, okay? So, um, after that, scores are available 30 to 35 days, and you, uh, you don't have to set that up for when the, uh, the application is due, but it's nice to, to line it up when um, the application gets submitted so that at least your test score is available when the application is, is done. And so as far as the application, MD schools open May 4th, and you can submit the application May 28th. And DO schools around that same time, May 4th, and you submit June 15th. And that's when it starts to be released to schools. Um, 
Now the application opening and submission is not the same as the application deadline, right? The deadline is the, the period that the school says, we will no longer accept any applications, right? But from June 15th or May 28th, all the way up until October for some MD schools and February for some uh, MD schools, you can still get your application in. It's not advised to do that um, because you get put to the back of the line. So if you submit later on in the cycle, schools have already offered seats. So you're already fighting for fewer seats than if you had submitted earlier. Again, it's that, that give and take. If your application isn't as strong as it possibly can be, then you may wanna wait a little bit so that you submit the strongest application or you update periodically to make sure that your application is the best that it can be, but you don't wanna wait too long because the seats are just gonna be gone. Um, good. Texas and some other schools have varied dates, uh, so you have to double check that. Again, each school will give you an idea of what they're expecting, so if you know the schools that you want to look at and apply for, uh, be sure to double check with those. Any questions so far? Okay. Feel free to interrupt me at any point if you have any questions. I'm trying to keep an eye on the chat, so... We'll see. Um, so how much time are you going to devote to studying? Wow, we're already halfway through and I'm only on tip two. Here we go. There's no set number. Uh, typically 300 to 400 hours is going to be recommended uh, for people who they've looked at uh, achieving scores that the, the people were very happy with. Um, 300 to 400 hours over the course of their study. Right. And this isn't including your coursework time. This is concerted MCAT uh, review, passage, reading and questions and full cat, uh, full length test exams, uh, practice exams. There's not a best way to spread those out, but um, the the recommended way that I will recommend is to build up stamina, stamina. You don't want to start with eight hours a day right off the beginning, right? You're going to burn out too quickly. You can't maintain that that long. So start out with just a couple hours and build, right? Build and build and build and ramp up so that the final few weeks, um, and depending on, on what your, your schedule is, what it looks like you're able to do, the final portion of your uh, study plan has you full length tests uh, on a day, take a break, do a couple practice uh, passages, review the content that you didn't do so well, and then hit another full length test, right? That's what you're going to be wanting, wanting to do right before the test, okay? You, and again, you can't maintain that. You can try, but most people are going to burn out before the test and you don't want to burn out before the test you don't want to do it so much that by the time you get to the test you're just like i don't care anymore that's the one time you do care the most so plan it so that you reach your peak right at that point uh what else to consider the cost is uh important it's not an insignificant amount Look into the fee assistance program. If you qualify for that, that's a significant chunk off of that. Um, what is the location that you're able to register for? How long does it take you to get there? Will that travel travel affect you psychologically? Are you going to have to spend the night at a different place? Is that going to put you outside of your comfort zone? Are you going to get a good enough sleep in a different bed? Are you going to have to deal with dogs barking or whatever? Uh, those things can affect you on test day. Um, and again, is there enough time before the registration date to get to, uh, to devote yourself enough to study? Okay, yeah, eight hours straight includes breaks. You definitely want to take breaks. You don't want to just have the book open or have the, the passages going eight hours straight because in the, the testing day, you are, will have breaks and you should take those breaks. You should give yourself a time to recharge, get water, have snacks, have your lunch in between, 
do the things that you need to do in order to keep your body's physiology at the, at the tip top shape so that you're performing the best, right? Because it does affect you. Get a good night's sleep the night before. Don't study the whole day the night before. Get some good sleep, right? That will help you. Get a good breakfast. Have some good snacks. Get protein. Get the things your body needs in order to have the energy to go the entire length. And practice that. Practice doing that routine so that on the test day, you're like, oh, shoot, now I got to take a break or, oh, now I, I got to do lunch. I don't normally do lunch, but now I have to do it. And so be used to it. So everything is, is expected. Um, so, yeah. And if we go back to the, I think I have another slide with the, the breaks, but I can go back to those. Um, and the, the, all that information is on the AMC website. So I think there's, there's a break in between each one. So there's definitely three or four breaks. Um, okay, here we go. So don't forget registration cost, plan to start around the same time or plan to take it around the application cycle so that you don't delay your application. If you do it earlier, that's fine. That's not gonna delay your application, uh, but it just depends on what your schedule is, uh, is going to work best with. 300, 400 hours total, and that's going to ramp up to 12 to 30 hours a week with, again, that's getting a similar duration of the test, developing that stamina. You need to uh, choose a realistic study plan. Your life is not going to slow down for you to take the MCAT. At least most people are not able to, to uh, take a break from normal life. Uh, and again, I, I, I don't know that I would recommend taking a break from normal life. You still need those other interactions, the social interactions, in order to uh, have the most healthy uh, mental health and physical health. So you're still going to have to work. Some of you might still have to go to school. Research and volunteer uh, opportunities are probably still going to be there. Family and social, extracurricular, all these things are not just going to stop because you are taking the MCAT. So plan around it. Um, when the time comes that you're going to do a concerted effort and you're going to have those full length days, try and, and work around it. So it's just a, 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 the time that you can manage to take away from these. Um, but taking every a break from every little thing um, and only focusing on the MCAT, I don't know, is realistic for most people. And uh, yeah, I don't know. It, it, again, everyone's different and you, you have to plan accordingly. Uh, so stick to a schedule, write out, plan out a schedule that you will stick to for the duration of what your days will look like. Um, the AMC study plan template can help guide you. Go there and they've got lots of resources on creating a study plan. Uh, see what resources you have available to you identify your weak areas so that you know what you're going to actually have to content review and other areas that you might not have to do as much review before doing uh, focusing in on a lot of uh, passages. Summary notes, MCAT vo vocabulary, concepts in real life scenarios, flashcards, looking at teaching other people, uh, passages, interpreting data, reading scientific uh, articles, identifying hypotheses, comparing contrast, all these things are going to be the, the types of strategies that you're gonna to wanna to implore into your MCAT study so that you're, you're ready for everything that the MCAT has to throw at you. Um, the commercial prep courses are effective motivators. Um, they do provide good planning and they usually provide really good prep uh, materials. They're mostly effective because you just spent a huge chunk of money. And if you don't use it, if you don't use the resources and make a plan, then you're going to be out $3,000 or more, right? So that's a pretty big motivation if you want to take that step. And many of the prep courses are uh, very good at what they do. So I, I don't want to talk down about the prep courses, um, but what they do, you can still do on your own. So with a good 
study plan. And if you're not able to afford a, a, a big prep course, there are free or low cost materials that can get you to the same point. Okay. You can still, if you have that motivation and you take the steps necessary, you make a plan and you ramp up your stamina towards the end, you can still perform very well in the MCAT. Okay. So don't lose hope. There's lots of other um, materials. Khan Academy has lots of videos and lots of practice questions. MCAT review has a great content-based review for everything that is could be on the, uh, the MCAT. And then AMC has other free and low cost materials. So again, here's a, a little excerpt from resources available, strategies available, things that you're gonna wanna list out to see what you have uh, in order to uh, create your plan. So identify resources, use the guide for your preparation, stick to your plan, um, but update it as you improve. Update things so that you're not just doing it because your plan said so, but you have a purpose for it. And be realistic with your time, okay? Uh, the next big thing, tip four, is going to be reading skills. A lot of uh, students who get accepted into medical school are like, oh, I really want to get started early. Is there a physiology book or an anatomy book? Should I take anatomy and, and learn all of that? Should I learn all the structures? And honestly, the only thing that really will hit true for everybody is just learn how to read lots and lots and lots of material learn how to go through scientific articles and learn so that's going into medical school so jump back a little bit trying to get into medical school through the mcat same thing you got to read you got to be able to read in order to do well on the mcat and the car section is all about that but the other sections cover that as well uh, CARS was the lowest compared to all other sections, at least in the 2018. I don't know if they've released uh, updated data on that. And this is especially apparent with English as a second language. Okay, It's not an easy thing to do to try and comprehend an author's um, point of view. Okay, So reading is going to be really important. So how do you do it? Easy answer, just read, right? Read news articles and read to understand. Don't just read to read, but read to comprehend. Uh, books and novels, right? Read things that you're interested in. Sometimes that actually shows up on the MCAT. They'll have a totally unrelated article about uh, music or about uh, some um, artist or musician or something like that in the car section that you have to uh, distill out the author's opinion on that, uh, on that subject. So reading about things like that, fiction, nonfiction, and comprehending the author's opinion is going to be important. Scientific journal articles, I wouldn't focus all my time there, but being able to read through that science jargon is going to be helpful for many of the, the science passages. Turn off your phone, set aside uh, any social media, even just having the notification pop up on your phone while you're studying decreases your cognitive ability, okay? Um, there's been lots of studies about this where they have someone taking an, an exam, taking a test, and they just the phone is just there. The phone's not even doing anything. It's just out on the table in front of them, and those groups perform less well than the groups who took the same test, same stuff, but with no phone. Okay. And then you add in notifications. It just disrupts your complex arguments and your memory recall. It's just It just does. So in general, this will be a good idea for studying, but especially for the MCAT. Put the phone away, disconnect from notifications, um, and you know everything has a time and place. Save that for later. Okay. Um, good. So enhance your reading. Car section will be especially helped with that, but um, the others will also. The, everything, you're going to have to read everything. So uh, the author's point of view is going to be what you care about. Do not insert or inject your own opinions on a subject into what it's asking about. 
the MCAT doesn't care what you think about the cars sections uh, topics. They want to know what the what is said within the topic. They want to know if you can decipher without putting your own opinion into it what is said in those subjects or in those uh, sections. So, uh, and then practice. Practice reading passages and identifying themes. And this is where uh, if you're able to get question banks or uh, preparatory material with these passages so that you can kind of test yourself at some point. It doesn't have to be the entire time, um, but getting that practice is going to be important. And reading faster is not always better. Sometimes it is. Sometimes it's helpful to read through quicker, but um, go at a pace that you can comprehend the material. Okay. There is also a breakdown of the um, scientific inquiry and reasoning skills. These, these are called the SIRs of each section. And each section of the MCAT has a, a separation of these types of questions within each passage. So you read a passage, one to two of them are going to be based on scientific concepts and principles. One or two is going to be scientific reasoning. Uh, or problem solving, the two of them are going to be on the design and the execution of the research, and then two will just be what did the what did kind of understanding what they say happened in the research or what the the data presented to you says about the research, being able to decipher that. Okay, that one. You don't need anything outside of the, the question to answer that as long as you have that basic understanding of how statistics and data is presented, right? Same thing with the design of, of research. As long as you have a basic foundation in research methods, this is all gonna be from the passage. It's gonna tell you the answer in the passage. They're giving you the answer there, right? That should make you so happy, they're like, oh, they gave me the answer to half of the questions, right? Those fools. But most people look at it and they say, oh, this was so hard. I don't understand most of what's going on there. And I can't remember what this, this assay was. And there, it, it becomes more difficult when you can't just identify the correct answer in the passage that they, they gave you, okay? Um, good. So that's the SIRS. What else did I want to say about that? Nope, that's it. Um, okay, so let's see. We've got one quick question. Angela, is there enough time to think about um, all the questions or is it fast paced? It is fast paced. You have to keep a good pace in order to move along with each passage. Um, but there's definitely enough time if you if you do a couple of things. You have to um, you have to break apart the the questions so that you're you're not searching like you, you identify a part of the question that goes back to the passage. If you can quickly refer back to it um, without having to reread the passage, that's going to save you a lot of time. And secondly. Once you're done with a passage, forget about it. Move on. Don't dwell on a previous passage if it's going to detract from what the, the next passages are, are saying to you or, or, or your, your uh, comprehension of the next passages. Just let it go. If you have time afterwards, then go back, right? There's no, nothing wrong with going back. And you, I'm, you, I'm fairly certain you can mark the, the passages that you might have had trouble with. Go back to them but don't dwell on it. Finish the rest of the passages so that you at least have an answer for every single question because you don't get penalized for incorrect answers. So it's only to your advantage to answer every question, okay? Go back uh, if you have extra time. I hope that was helpful. So let's see, study practice and use full length exams. You're gonna, want to review certain material up to a certain point, but you're going to want to move away from that content review as you get more towards you know, your ramp up 
do less content review and more focus on passages and reading uh, and answering these questions, right? Answering questions will help you. The more questions you have gone through in your study, the more likely you are to achieve a score that you're going to be happy with and, and a better score in your eyes. And again, that range is different and that's different for everybody. But generally, people who have gone through more questions perform better. Um, and that, again, should culminate in the use of full length exams. One or two is not enough. You need at least three or more, depending on your time frame and depending on your resources and um, the, what you have access to. This, again, I keep talking about it because it's important. This should be your final step before the final, the, the exam, exam day doing multiple full-length exams over a short amount of time in the end. Most people will start out with a diagnostic exam, which is pretty important to see where you're starting from and see maybe where your weaknesses are. And then you can build your plan off of that. And then a lot of people will have a, another diagnostic exam kind of in the middle uh, portion. Most people don't have the ability to have it spaced out so that they're taking a bunch throughout the whole um, study time. But the final exams, you need to have several towards the end, again, because that's going to build up your stamina. That's going to tell you, are you ready? Have you done the, the legwork to be ready for that portion, the, the full length exam? Um, so yeah, test your stamina, build it up over time, recreate the setting and the attitude of the day. On these full length exams, take the breaks that you need, eating restroom, stay hydrated, limit distractions when you're doing these full length exams so that you're in the zone and it's just like you're on the test. So it'll give you the best feedback for getting you ready for that day. You can purchase full length exams from uh, AAMC. They have, I think four now, they have four uh, pra full length practice exams and each one is $35, I think like that. Uh, there are other options too. Blueprint Prep has six full-length exams for $199. Uh, Kaplan has three for $179. They apparently think that their tests are better, worth the same as six. I don't know. Uh, I haven't done either of these. I did Kaplan a long time ago, so uh, they seem fine. I haven't done Blueprint. I don't know the quality of it. I, I would imagine anything that gets you reading and reviewing the questions is still going to be beneficial even if maybe these aren't, oh, exactly, I don't know. And they may be just fine. I, I, I don't work for them and I haven't reviewed them, so I don't know. Uh, Princeton Review has one free full-length exam and I think they use it to entice you. They, they feel very strongly about their uh, materials and that if you don't achieve a score, then you get a refund. So, you know, that can be a good thing. But again, that comes with, you take the diagnostic and, are you already there at your diagnostic or are you lower? And then did you do all the steps in between for their program? Because they're not going to give you your money back if you took the test and then took a couple other things, but didn't put in the concerted effort that they feel would give you to the get you to the top score. Just because you're paying for it doesn't mean that you're going to get a better score. You have to still do the work. They just work, they just work that into their study plan to kind of force you into that. And again, if you're able to, to purchase that, a lot of people do. And they make a lot of money off of that. And they, they get a lot of people good scores. Uh, but you don't have to, is what I'm saying. So each passage is going to have the application of the SIRS. Um, so get in the habit of identifying. Most of the practice passages will have that same distribution of SIRS get in the habit of identifying which ones are going to fall in each of these uh, scientific inquiry and reasoning skills. Um, and like I said, many are just going to ask about the scenario, about the equipment setup. So if you can understand it, then you've already been given the answer and you can, that's, a, that's an easy point there. Um, and then all unknown questions, answer it, regardless if you understand it or not. Uh, throw an answer on there. It's going to help you one way or another, 25% of the time. 
Uh, and don't dwell on those previous questions. Let it go. Move on. Be like Elsa. Okay. Um, so we've got, oh yeah, here, $35 uh, dollars each for the full length exams. Shooting for three or four full length tests before exam day is going to be recommended more if you're able to. Um, and then use the scores to inform your study and improve your plan. Don't dwell on the scores and don't think just because you got one test score that is really, really good, that that's what you're going to get. If you've shown consistently that you can, then you should feel really positive about it. If you've shown, excuse me, consistent improvement, again, you should feel really positive. If you see one drop for a given test, use that to inform your study, but don't get discouraged by it. Don't dwell on it. Keep moving forward, okay? There it is. Don't obsess over a score. Look to see how you can learn and grow from it. Um, so here's our summary. Finish your coursework, right? That's where you're going to learn the bulk of the information that you're going to apply in there. That's where you're going to get your uh, scientific uh, reasoning skills and your experimental design. All of those are heavily integrated into science courses, the prereq courses for medical school. So do well in them. Learn from them. Don't just go in it looking for a grade because you uh, need to boost your GPA. That's good. Yeah, you know, get a good GPA. But as far as the MCAT is concerned, you want to do well in it so that you can apply that material later. Register for the test on time. Plan out when you're going to start your study, when you're going to end your study, and if that's going to line up with registration for the test and if you're able to register for the test by that point. Take a diagnostic exam and create that study plan. Read, 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 right? If a part of your study plan is just reading some uh, at the beginning, reading anything, or if you don't, if you're not ready to start the MCAT uh, prep right now, reading is something that is not gonna burn you out, right? Most people enjoy reading certain materials. Read it, right? Read it while you're in the in the kind of holding pattern before you start your big concerted MCAT study time. Get good at reading various types of articles. And then uh, apply the SIRS. Know how to distinguish between the different types of questions that they're going to ask within a passage and recreate that test with multiple full length pra practice tests. So if I were preparing in the the time now between when I would start my study, I would be kind of formulating my plan and I'd be reading as much as possible, reading things that I like to read, forcing myself to read scientific articles, even though I like to read those too. Um, not all of them. Some scientific articles are the worst, but get good at reading a lot of different things. And then in the months up to where your test is, you know, it might be eight weeks, six weeks, it depends on what you're gonna be able to, to handle to ramp up your time, but calculate it out so that by the end, you've accumulated three to 400 hours of specific concerted study time that you've planned out. So yeah, like I said, six to eight weeks before, that's when you're gonna start a lot of the, uh, the passage reading, maybe content review, um, going into specific things for the test. And that's going to ramp up. You might start with two to three hours a day, two to three hours a day, then do a four hour day, then drop down two to three, and then ramp up to three to four, and then four to four to five. And as you get closer, you're, you're increasing the amount of time that you're spending on this, um, on the study. And at the beginning, you can spend a little more time doing content review, and as you transition more towards the end of the study, you're doing a lot more passages, a lot more questions and full length exams and a lot less of that content review, okay? These are my tips. Not everyone uh, approaches it the same way and that's okay too, right? If you have figured out a way that works for you and you, the, there's a lot of great advice online, 
of how people have achieved this score. Read through it, see what they did, tease out the information. If they're trying to promote some, uh, some program that they're gonna pay for, then take that with a grain of salt and understand that, that those are businesses. So they're, they're definitely gonna talk well about themselves, but some of them do really have great uh, options. So read through it, use everything to your best advantage so that you're ready by the end of, the, of your study time to, to perform well on that test. And that's all I've got. I'm open for questions and we can go back over any material if you need. Does anybody have any questions? <laughs> All right, it looks like we are, uh, first of all, thank you, Dr. Steed, and we appreciate this. This has been really great. First time that we've done something like this, so thank you. Um, we do have a couple of questions in the chat. Um, first question is, I believe, um, if I wanna to go to medical school after my fourth year, when would be a good time to take the MCAT? There you go. So again, um, the, the timing is everything. And a lot of uh, a lot of people take the, a gap year. Some people are able to align it uh, well, but it, it, it's all going to be based on when is the application open, and when are you able to take the MCAT, right? So if you want to go to medical school after your fourth year, and you want to go right after it, you, you're not taking a, a gap year, then that means all of the things need to happen the year before. In your junior year because the application process is just is an entire year long and so you're going to hit submit on june of this year in your um you know you have done all the all the mcat study previous stuff in your junior and maybe early senior year and then um from june until that next june that's the application process right and most most schools start in june july uh, so that whole process is going to take a year. So if you want to enter that year after, you have to have taken the steps starting in junior and early senior year in order to get your application in and have everything that you need ready in June of the year before. Does that make sense? Great, thank you. Next question. You mentioned some MCAT courses earlier. I think it might have been specific MCAT tools. What? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a ton of them. Um, the I, and I'm not associated with any of them. Um, the big ones are Princeton Review, Kaplan. Um, what is it? MCAT crackers or test crackers? That there's there's a, a bunch of different ones. The big names are going to be more expensive, but that's because more people use them and they they can. Uh, have higher prices because they're they're making money, right? Um, most all of them will be beneficial in, in some way if you use them, right? Just because you're buying this service doesn't mean that you're automatically going to get a uh, a better score on the MCAT. You're buying their experience in order to motivate you and give you a a, a, a steady plan and uh, get you ready for that exam, that's gonna be the exact same as if you can motivate yourself and set that plan yourself, and then maybe buy a couple of those resources like the passages for test banks and um, full length practice exams. If you can motivate yourself and have a, a plan that you feel is, is strong enough, you don't necessarily need to pay for that, uh, that service from an MCAT prep program. And again, there's a bunch of them. I listed a couple. The Blueprint one has their own thing. And um, most of them have portions that you can purchase, like the full length exams or test bank, question banks or passage banks. Uh, so see what resources you might need. Or if you're just going to do the whole package, you can do that too. And just additionally, we do have some things on our website regarding um, MCAT products. Just like Dr. Steed mentioned, we don't endorse any of those, but we do have a directory. If you go into our website and you go under test slash application preparation, we have um, some ideas for MCAT preparation. We also have some MCAT blogs where we've had students that have written and talked about 
their experience prepping for the MCAT. So that's all available on the HPAC website. Um, and you can just jump on at any time and, and check that out. Um, let's see, we have another question. Um, do I have to take the MCAT before I submit my application to medical school? Technically, no. Uh, you can submit your application without having an MCAT score. Um, but what that will do is they're going to receive your application and do a review and see, do they have everything they need to move on to the next phase? You won't get moved from your primary application to your secondary application until you've met all of their minimum requirements. So you can submit it, um, but you're still going to be kind of kicked to a, a different pile and different end of the line until you have that, that score. Uh, and Dr. Yule, uh, it, it looks like you turned on to maybe answer that as well. Yeah, I mean, to apply, you won't need the score, but absolutely, it, it's not, actually, it's, it's, it's highly unlikely that you'll be invited to complete a secondary unless the institution doesn't require the MCAT for admissions, um, because there's a particular thresholds that most of these institutions are going to have to, to invite you to complete a secondary and then to ultimately, or excuse me, eventually invite you to interview, you're going to have to um, complete a variety of things. And so MCAT's one of them. You can begin the application, but you just won't be moving forward unless that particular institution, again, doesn't require the MCAT. All right, great. Um, I think one last question. Uh, we have a student that asked about they know that there are different sections on the MCAT. Um, how are those sections spread out on the exam? Sure. Uh, I'm displaying exactly how they're spread out right here. So you have your CP FBS. You'll get 95 minutes of just CP FBS with 59 questions, most of them in 10 passage based sets of four to six, and then 15 individual questions. You'll get a break. And then you'll go into BBFL, same thing, 59 questions, 10 passages, 15 independent. You'll get a lunch break, and then you go into psychological with 59 questions, 10 passages, 15 individual questions, another break, and then cars with 53 questions, all in passages. So that's the breakdown of how it is. Um, they don't spread them out between, it's all one section with this. And that's not to say that you won't have overlap within a section, right? There will be, uh, this says chemical and physical of biological systems. So there's still gonna be some biology in here, even though it's mainly focused on chemical reactions and physical properties. Most of the biology is gonna be here, but for things that require chemical interactions in an assay or something like that, you'll still have that appear in here. So it, it focuses on a, a discipline, but it's not only that discipline. It's not a biology section and a chemistry section and a physics section, right? It's, it's spread out in between those. All right, great. Thank you for answering that and the questions that were posed. And thank you so much for um, today's session on just the MCAT review. We appreciate your time. And um, for our students, we have recorded this, so we will put it on the YouTube, uh, HPAC YouTube channel. Uh, we should have it up by mid uh, next week. And um, last, if you joined us after we got started, um, again, this was put together by California Health Sciences University. And uh, Dr. Yule, I'm just gonna give you a, a moment to share about tomorrow that you're gonna be visiting campus and where our students can find you. Certainly, yes, I'll be at the event on campus tomorrow. I have um, brochures and information about CHSU, College of Osteopathic Medicine. I will be there with a whole bunch of business cards. So um, you'll be able, we'll be able to e exchange um, emails so that if you have any uh, questions um, about our programs or about the admissions process, anything of that nature, um, I'll be able to, to give you my email so I can answer those questions. Um, but yeah, I'll be there bright and early tomorrow at 11. Um, so looking forward to meeting any of you that are um, interested in osteopathic medicine.